Have you ever played a game that causes this? Here, let me clarify. What I'm asking is, have you ever played a video game that physically required so much out of you, you developed arthritis, carpal tunnel, giant blisters, and a bad case of busted joystick syndrome? Listen, I'm not crazy. You just haven't played Mario Party 1. Video games by design are interactive, and one of the key components that make that happen is the controller, the device that bridges the gap between the screen and yourself. It's vitally important that when designing a game, control is a top priority. It's a crucial pillar in this interactive entertainment, and if not done properly, well, it just, it just outright sucks. And you know, it's one thing to have a game not respond well to your inputs, but it's another thing when a game asks for inputs that don't respond well to you. Physically abusive video games. Now, we ain't talking about Wii Fit today. In order for a game to be physically taxing in my eyes, it has to fit this criteria. The game in question either A, physically oh. wears your controllers, or B, physically oh. hurts you. When it comes to this topic, rarely is a game ever intentionally designed to be this way. I said rarely. Rather, these situations are mainly self-imposed, usually in a competitive context. Speedrunning, PvP, local versus, it doesn't matter. A competitive mindset is whatever it takes, and sometimes whatever it takes requires some sacrifices. And what better genre oozes competitive nature than the fighting game genre, both figuratively and literally. Fighting games peaked really at the dawn of time. That's right, the 90s. I've never really been a huge fan of the genre, simply because I know how complex these games can be. Most of their taxing qualities are obviously in performing combos. When you have combo lists that look like this, you can sit in the dark abyss of sadness and no bliss and you can kiss your thumbs goodbye. Of course, it varies game to game, but combos can take a lot of inputs to execute, including joystick rotations and zigzags, all while doing them at rapid speeds. So you would think, especially in the days of the arcade, they would have broken joysticks at the very least, right? Well, to my surprise, not really. Based on my research, I haven't seen many cases of hardware harm. Even though these games are so close in fitting this criteria, most controllers and joints are suitable and durable enough for fighting games. And if you really are serious about the genre, fighting sticks are literally designed for inputs like this. So these games may be less taxing and more just technical, but I thought they could be an honorable mention. But look, I get it. You're not here for honorable mentions. You're here to see if there's a game out there that can physically hurt people. And to that I say, what is wrong with you? Super Smash Bros. Melee, one of the most competitive video games on the planet. And while that's just one of the many different titles this game has, Melee is also one of the most technical video games on the planet. Looking at high-level gameplay, it's really not that hard to see Melee requires a ton of technical skill. Smash has so many different factors to consider, but at Melee's core, most of its technicality is found in its movement. Compared to arcade fighters, players now have a wider range of mobility and options to maneuver around. As a whole, Smash is very input heavy, with Melee being the fastest game in the series. Most high-level players average up to 5 to 8 inputs per second! Do you know what this looks like? I'm sweating just looking at this. Combining the sheer speed of Melee plus the constant repeating inputs your thumbs are making on top of the long sessions of play, it's no surprise that people have had cases of physical injury, because if arthritis was a sound, uh, this would be it. Many players have expressed sharp pains in their hands or thumbs. Top player Hacks even suffered a serious injury during a tournament in 2014 that revealed a plethora of problems, including signs of basal thumb joint arthritis. Now, I understand that doing anything related to joint movements for long periods of time can lead to things like arthritis, but I can't help but look at top-level melee and think to myself, joint pain. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I mean, high-level melee is a tense hobby to indulge in, with frame-perfect inputs and matches that are crazy intense, which, depending on what type of gamer you are, can naturally lead to suffocating your controller because of how tense you are. Look, I'm not trying to scare people away from melee. That's not my goal here. I'm just saying melee has the right ingredients for a physically taxing experience. Of course, if you're playing casually, there's really nothing to worry about. Again, have there been players that have left the Smash scene due to physical pain? Yes. Have there been players that have literally played for decades that have suffered no injuries? Also yes. The community is well aware of this issue, with multiple top players suffering injuries. People from the community have taken it upon themselves to reduce these cases and design a controller that's more ergonomic for players' hands. In other words, they put buttons on a box. This not only relieves stress and pain from players' joints, but also gains the benefit of more precise inputs, because that's a whole nother issue. You see, high-level melee abuses both parties involved. Compared with typical fighting games that have a movement range of eight different directions, Smash Bros. has 360 analog movement, meaning this joystick is pretty important. And when you have players who dash dance repeatedly at the speed of a freaking chainsaw, you can see why this is also a problem. I think that's partially why the controller modding scene for this game is so popular. I mean, yeah, fancy mechanisms and enhancements always helps, but anything to increase the sheer durability of a GameCube controller, I'm sure, is a huge appeal. When it comes to competitive melee, everything from hands, fingers, and hardware are at risk for physical harm. But it really just goes to show just just how serious the Smash community can be. You know what else is serious? Destroying DS triggers. And guess what causes this trauma? Here we go! Okay, now this is more of a personal example, but it was so significant I couldn't pass up sharing this. I had a few great games on the DS, not too many sleepers if you ask me, and Mario Kart DS was probably my favorite game on the system. It rightfully takes its place as one of the best Mario Kart titles. Great tracks, great roster, lots of content for a middle schooler back in the day to dig into. I dug into it so much, in fact, that my DS was starting to show signs of hardware malfunctions, specifically in the L and R triggers. I could chalk this up to overall playtime with the system, but seeing as the problems were specifically placed in the triggers, I narrowed down my reasons to this culprit right here. Look, I love you, but I also just want to, like, flick you. Mario Kart has two essential mechanics, items and drifting, which are conveniently placed as the left and right trigger inputs in every single game in the series. They make it so natural that you don't even realize you're constantly using these actions at all times. Only problem with the handheld Mario Karts is, at least in my case, the DS triggers weren't that durable. I really can't tell you if this experience was exclusive to me or not, and if so, I must have been holding bananas behind me like my life depended on it, like good grief. And it gets better because this not only happened once, but twice. And it wasn't like the triggers sometimes worked, barely worked, no, they completely stopped functioning on both my DS and eventually my 3DS. The worst thing about it was a lot of my games were unplayable because literally both triggers were out of commission. And it's not like the Switch where if a button breaks you can slip off the Joy-Con and replace it, which happens a lot nowadays because if I really wanted to, I could put the whole Switch library in this video because apparently playing anything with Joy-Cons causes Joy-Con drift! Holy crap! <laughs> Anyways, you know the saying that you don't really realize how important something is until it's gone? Well, that's like me with DS triggers. Yeah, it's funny looking back, but I can finally put this story to rest. I'm unsubscribing from this trauma. You know what you should subscribe to, though? My yeah, YouTube totally channel. Nintendo was a huge part of my childhood, but I would be lying if Minecraft didn't take over for a good while. Ah yes, Minecraft, home to creepers, crafting, and chronic pain. I grew up during the peak phase of multiplayer minigame servers, before the days where SMPs, 100 days, and manhunts were popularized. I always got bored with single player survival, so instead of comboing the crap out of creepers, I was more interested in authentic player versus player. Now this was before the infamous 1.9 combat update. For those uneducated, before 1.9, Minecraft's PvP 
PvP was boiled down to basically a game of who could click the fastest. CPS, or clicks per second, was an important factor in winning fights. So, like any competitive community would, players came up with the most optimal methods to click as fast as humanly possible. Over the years, two methods stood out from the rest and evolved into the standard techniques of high-level PvP. Butterfly clicking and jitter clicking. These two methods dominated the PvP scene. You would have never caught me doing these. <laughs> One method looks like you're having a full-on seizure and the other looks like you're an aggressive wizard trying to cast a spell. I mean, I was pretty sweaty, but not that sweaty. I had my methods. Now on the surface, these techniques look pretty harmless. I mean, mice are meant to be clicked. What's the big deal, I hear you asking? Well, to put it bluntly, RSI, repetitive strain injury. Now, I realize this symptom is practically the main definition of this whole video, but this is often been brought up within the Minecraft community, so I thought I would mention it here. For years, there's been a controversial myth surrounding these techniques and their level of harm. Some say they've caused arthritis, others have said carpal tunnel, or even severe wrist pain in general, and while there's been no scientific evidence surrounding all this, if I had to argue one method that makes this believable, it would be jitter clicking. The whole goal of jitter clicking is to tense your arm up so hard that you start to physically vibrate. You then channel that vibration through your hand right above your mouse, which results in a jittering sensation of clicks. It may give good results, but it sure doesn't give good feelings. I can't imagine using this technique regularly. My arm gets so fatigued within seconds of jittering. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, eventually you get used to it and you don't feel anything. I'm not sure if that's a positive. It's another one of those case-by-case -case deals. Some people have tried it with no pain, while well, others have. And while I wouldn't say it's painful, I could see it being damaging after long sessions of play. The community has come to the conclusion that poor wrist posture is the main cause of pain, which is most likely true, but combined with the constant tension and vibration throughout your arm, I don't think your joints are gonna feel good after playing any game like that. Again, there's no scientific proof that it's harmful. All I know is that there are people out there that have legitimately suffered chronic pain due to Minecraft. You don't hear that one every day. Want to hear another one? My Nintendo 64 abused me. What if I told you that there is a game out there that is so intense, so competitive, so harmful that controllers, hands, and even friendships are at the brink of breaking every single time this game is booted up? Some love it, some hate it, and some are traumatized by it. I present to you the most abusive video game probably in existence. Mario Party. This game is a different breed. I know this series has like 15 of these games, and while I'm sure most of them could fit the taxing criteria, I needed to talk about the one that started it all on the Nintendo 64. You see, I grew up with Mario Party 1. A good friend of mine owned it, and whenever I was at his house, we always found ourselves playing it like, I don't know, 80% of the time? Its random chaotic energy made it the most fun and replayable multiplayer experience of my childhood. The comebacks, the backstabbing, the chance times, it was the perfect recipe for a wildly competitive board game experience. Which as you've learned, competitive can lead to painful. You can't have a Mario Party without the mini-games. After everyone has done their turn, you get thrown into one of these things at random, and the winner receives an award. You'll have many instances where one player needs to win to take the lead, so you know everyone else is going to do whatever it takes to stop that from happening. All the mini-games vary when it comes to its theming and objectives. However, a lot of them reuse the same control schemes. A majority of the controls can be categorized into things like standard 3D platforming or rhythmic-based button pressing, but there's two specific types of minigames that are infamously known for having the most abusive input requirements known to man. Let's start with the button mashers. Okay, admittedly, these aren't the worst things in the world. In fact, it's one of the more common types of minigames Mario Party is known for. However, don't let these games fool you. 
Button mashing is a term for rapidly pressing buttons on your controller, and when playing Mario Party whenever a minigame like this shows up, the aggression in the room goes from 0 to 100. It's similar to jitter clicking in that when trying to mash quickly, your arm naturally tenses up in the process. But unlike jitter clicking, where Minecraft fights end relatively fast, most of these minigames require longer periods of non-stop aggressive mashing. The nice thing about Mario Party though is more often than not, you get breaks in between each mash minigames specifically, but these poor things don't. I wouldn't say I've broken any controllers doing this, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say it's probably not the best thing for them. And also your hands. One notable case of hand harm was with the famous funny guy Alpharad deciding to take Mario Party a little too far and grind out speedruns for so long he developed carpal tunnel in not one, but both hands. And I'm just gonna say this. I don't think any other minigames would cause something like this. Now, was this done on the original Mario Party? Well, no. Did this happen due to long sessions of playtime rather than the minigames themselves? Yeah, probably, most likely a combination of both, but, but that doesn't matter, it still happened, and it was within the Mario Party series, also with the hand problems arising within a button masher, so... I rest my case. Again, I, I feel like I need to reiterate this. Does this happen to everyone? No. Can it happen to anyone? Yeah, probably. Moving on, unlike button mashers, I have personal history with these next set of minigames. These are without a doubt the most physically demanding games I have ever played personally. So let's conclude with talking about the joystick rotating minigame. In the 90s, the Nintendo 64 introduced many new players to the fancy schmancy joystick, which would only make sense for them to utilize this technology to their full extent, and I mean full extent, to show off their awesome new hardware in their brand new party game for children. Okay, so specifically in Mario Party 1, a handful of minigames had control schemes that required the players to make full rotations with the joystick. Sounds innocent so far. The only issue was the way to win most of these games were determined on how fast you could rotate these things. Now these N64 sticks were pretty awkward to do this quickly with your thumb. So of course with this game's competitive nature, it quickly became apparent there was a better strategy and players found way more success using their palm. These minigames were notorious for being hard for me and my friends. I don't even remember not using this strategy. I just remember whenever Tug of War would show up, I knew I wasn't going down without a fight. It was all or nothing, whatever it takes. Yowchies. Yeah, these minigames were really just a recipe for disaster. You have the aggressiveness Mario Party brings, plus the intense speed of rotating with your palm, which then causes an extreme amount of friction between the hand and the joystick. All of this accumulates into a blistering mess right smack center in the palm of your hand. Quite literally. I experienced this first hand, well, right hand to be exact. I remember me and my friend were just finishing up a long session of Mario Party when we ran into one of these minigames near the end. After losing terribly, I felt this burning sensation in my hand. Come to find out later, a blister had formed in the dead center of my palm. I can't make this stuff up. Oh, and I'm not done because years later, it was surprisingly brought to my attention I wasn't the only one who suffered through this experience. So apparently when Mario Party was first released, there were several reports of players receiving blisters or even friction burns due to these specific minigames. No official lawsuits were filed. However, around 90 complaints were reported to the New York's attorney office. Nintendo of America eventually came up with a settlement that stated they would provide hand gloves to injured players as well as pay the state's $75,000 legal fees. If Nintendo was to provide gloves to even 1 million players at that time, it would have costed them upwards to $80 million. That is a hefty price for some Mario-themed tug-of-war. I didn't know anything about this when this first happened to me, partly because I played this game a decade after release, when I was six years old. I haven't even talked about how bad these minigames are for your controllers. I mean, I know it's not that obvious, but, but just think about it. It's obvious that a company like Nintendo wouldn't want to risk any more potential million dollar lawsuits. So with the next Mario Parties going forward, they strayed away from the top speed joystick rotating in the minigame department.
until the Switch came along. I guess the Switch sold well enough that they were willing to risk it once again on good old Tug of War. This minigame still sucks. Mario Party is home to some of my favorite childhood memories, and while most of them are fun and exciting moments, it's also amusing looking back on some of the more harmful experiences. Well, uh, that's about all the games I could come up with. Now, I realize that most of these harmful cases come down to the player's intensity rather than the games themselves, but I also think there are certain games out there that provide the perfect ingredients for a physically abusive experience to the player, whether intentional or not. So if you have any other games that you feel fit this criteria, please leave a comment down below telling me your picks because I am genuinely interested in hearing if you guys have any others. So, but anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. If you wanna support me in any way, uh, liking the video, sharing it, uh, subscribing is a great way to do so. Uh, but again, thank you so much for watching and I will hopefully see you guys here soon.